Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by rockauto.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Hey, thank you, Alec Webb, and welcome everyone to MotorWeek podcast number 240. I'm John Davis, and joining me today are our, our writer, two-wheeling reporter, Brian Robinson. Hello, everyone. Looks like a nice day where you are, Brian. Our over-the-edge reporter, Greg Carlos. Hello, hello. And we are delighted to have a special guest, our online auto parts expert, Tom Taylor. Tom, welcome. Well, thanks for having me, John. Okay, we got a lot to get to today, but uh, because Tom is here, we're going to start with him first. We'll do that. We've got a car to talk about, a lightning round. We've got a question from a viewer. We'll see if any of you have got any rant and raves. But Tom, there, you brought up a subject when we were uh, getting ready to plan this uh, podcast that really hadn't occurred to me, and that is we all know that you're really supposed to pay attention to the owner's manual when you are doing your oil changes to make sure you use the correct oil. But I really wasn't that aware that the fact that most cars now are direct injection, that that also had effect on it. So why don't, with that little bit of introduction, why don't you elaborate what's going on when it comes to direct injection vehicles and oil changes? Well, they discovered uh, that direct injection, you, you're putting the gas right into the cylinder instead of having to go through the intake manifold and have right. a one-time mix with the air. So when you spray right into high pressure right into the, the combustion chamber, it doesn't have time to mix with the fuel necessarily adequately. So they're starting to see that over time you'd have soot build up and that soot would get mixed in with the oil and get uh, cause wear in the engines, specifically in the timing chain. It, it would loosen the links in the timing chain and the timing chain would skip or or uh, and so the engine would either throw an error code or not run. And then the other problem they saw was in the turbocharged direct injection engines, there would be knocking. Is I think they call low speed, uh, uh, low speed pre-ignition. Yeah, I've actually heard that. And as it gets so severe to the end, it would be when you're starting out at, at, at low speed and you're, you're, there's a heavy strain on the engine. So like if you're starting out from the stoplight or something, giving it lots of gas, but not, not moving real fast yet. So uh, about two years ago, the uh, oil institutes came up with a spec to help reduce that called SN plus. And you'll see that on oil bottles. You're familiar on the back of the oil bottle will be GF5, SN, it used to be GF4, right. SM. Um, so, so, so there was SN plus to help with, to fight those problems with the direct injection engines. And then this year they came out with a GF6 SP that that specifically again is to help the direct injection engines prevent the problems. And, and it's really interestingly, it's really tied in with the Ford EcoBoost um, engine. It's actually part of the specification to get the GF uh, SP classification is the oil has to be tested on a Ford EcoBoost. And it, it, I don't think it's so much that the EcoBoost engines have a have a uh, more of a problem than other direct injection engines, but Ford has just sold a lot more direct injection turbocharged engines than anybody else. And they, they put them in everything from little, little engines and little tiny cars to larger engines and big trucks accumulated hundreds of thousands of miles. So the EcoBoost is the best platform they have for testing these, these new oils and coming up with now specs. are all, you know, it used to be that, all the oil when they would come out with a new one and you know sf sh whatever that they were always downward compatible is that still true it is but not so far back they'll they'll, they'll, they'll say it's backward compatible you know for the last 20 years but the uh where it's not backwards compatible necessarily is with old flat tappet engines mm. where you don't have um, you have two pieces of metal banging against each other and the zinc and zinc slash phosphorus has been taken out of the oil. So there's conflicting story. It's not been taken out, it's been reduced. So there's some people are worried that'll cause wear and old black tappet engines. And if you're worried about that, there's there's racing oil um, that's made with more zinc, more phosphorus. It, it's not appropriate for newer cars, um, but, but it'll be good for those old flat tappet engines. So 
in the end, <coughs> excuse me, the best advice, is it still just to go by the owner's manual or if you've got one that says, you know, uh, SN, can you, you can use SP, but don't go too far down the link. The owner's manual will usually specify the viscosity, right. like 0W20 or 5W3. So, so definitely follow that. And, and then the, the car manufacturers usually have their own spec, which will be a big alphabet soup of letters. And, and so some oil manufacturers will put that on their bottle too. And, and sometimes that's a mix of marketing. The, oil, the car manufacturer wants to sell their the oil. They have an agreement with the, uh, a marketing agreement with, with some oil company. Um, but the, yeah, the, to answer your question, the main thing is the viscosity, and, and then you're, you're you're safe if you just go with the the, the newest what, what's on the shelf, the SN S plus um, or SP. Yeah. What well, what you don't want to do is, uh, and I'm I'm always surprised. I stop at a gas station at a grocery store or something, and, and they'll have racks of 10W30 sitting there, yeah. and I'm like, well, 10W30 hasn't been spec in a gasoline for a gasoline car since the early 90s. So a lot of people are, are putting the wrong oil in their, in their car. And whether it's direct injection, or, uh, almost every new car has, is using oil, not just as lubrication and cooling, but as, as like a hydraulic fluid to control uh, um, cylinder timing. management. You switch from four to six or six to eight, um, variable valve timing, all sorts of things. So you, the main thing is use the viscosity that the, uh, that the car manufacturer recommended. Yeah, I'm I'm amazed that you can actually go into a service, quote unquote, quick oil change or something, and you know, they're selling 10W30 to a relatively new, you know, automobile, and you're thinking, get me out of here as fast as I can. Yeah, yeah, and the 10W30 is actually recommended by Ford. They have a special 10W30 for certain Ford diesels. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, you really have to pay attention. You brought up a good point. You've got to talk to the where you take it. You, even if it's a dealer, you, you got to hey, you're just not using what you have a big can of, and you want to get rid of there. And you, you're using the right oil for my for my vehicle. And I guess we should point out that you know a lot of new engines are five W something, and some are even zero. And it's all a matter of, of of how the engines are built now with tighter tolerances and so forth. Right, right, right. And if you have an old an older engine, you don't don't think you'll get. Oh, yeah, I get better gas mileage if I if I use zero W sixteen no. in your oil because it, it wasn't made for that. So it, it's not providing adequate uh, lubrication between the moving parts. While I got, while I've got you on the line, there, there's a couple of things that since I know you stay up with what's going on with parts on all the new cars, which has got to be a, a monumental task. Two things. One is not seasonal, but one is. But first thing is, just this past week, I did a, 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 and I bet I passed in the course of a day five or six cars with daytime running lights out on one side or the other. And a couple of those cars were LED equipped vehicles. Now, I've always been under the impression that, you know, the big problem with LEDs is that it's generally a, a dealer. Uh, item because they're often molded into the cases and so forth. From your perspective, looking at what's going on in online parts, is there anything a consumer can do that will cost save them some money when they have an LED light problem on, you know, a car built in the last few years? You know, if there's demand for the parts, then the the uh, aftermarket retailers will will have the parts. So yeah, LEDs are available. But they are often part of the like you described, the, the headlight assembly. Yeah. So, so it'll be a body part versus just a bulb. And, and so it, it might be more expensive, um, but it, it'll be a lot cheaper than the car dealer will charge and, and they are available. What about drivers? Are they all self-contained now or do you have to, are there other components? When they first started doing a lot of these high energy lamps, they had some power supplies and stuff that actually cost more than the, the light fixtures. Yeah, the high intensity discharge lights, there's a ballast that the bulbs are, are more expensive and the ballasts are expensive also. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not familiar with, I don't think that's on any cars with LEDs where there's a separate driver that has to uh, power the bulb. I mean, the whole idea there is to save energy. Right. 
Also, this is, uh, we're, we're recording this uh, in the middle of October, and October is a National Fall Car Care Month. How about some sage advice on what people, should, especially if you're sitting at home doing less so, you know, going out that you should have, give us some sage advice about parts people should be looking at to get their car ready for winter. And while you're at it, I'm going to ask you to answer, to answer the question that we get almost daily. And that is, if my car is sitting at home, should I change the oil as frequently as I was beforehand? Let's see what you got to say. Uh, I'll answer that one first before, before I forget. But it, I saw last, your last podcast, you discussed that. And, and everything you said was right. Um, a lot of it depends on where you're at. If you're in Florida and the car is sitting and, and the car's in a, a humid garage where there might be a lot of condensation forming inside the engine, you're going to want to change the oil even if just time versus miles have passed. But if you're in a more temperate, drier climate, then I would worry about it unless I was worried about keeping a records for warranty. Maybe yeah, that's my big um, thing. Or miles are more important. So yeah, it depends on, on where you store your car. Because I always look at it as, um, yeah, oil may degrade over time, but we're talking a lot mm -hmm. of time to degrade oil. And the oil doesn't know if it's in the bottle or in your crankcase unless you get, it's in a high humidity environment or something. So, so yeah, there, it's kind of a long answer. There's no, it depends where you are. Okay, seasonal parts. What should people be doing? Okay. Well, the, the huge one, and it's not just the winter's coming, it's the apocalypse season we're all living yeah. through now too, it, it is the, the car battery. Mm. Um, car battery sales are through the roof because cars have been sitting um, and that, that'll even become more apparent as the weather gets colder. And so, some, so uh, something I, I highly recommend is these new battery chargers that are smart. You can be hooked up to the car indefinitely. Um, they'll, they'll prevent problems if your car's been sitting a lot because you've been working from home or whatever. And they also extend the life of the battery, battery dramatically. Um, I, yesterday, I just replaced the battery in my 1992 Dodge van. And I'm like, well, gosh, it's been a while. And the battery was 12 years oh. old. Because when I'm not driving, I leave it hooked up to a battery charger. So, yeah, get a new battery if you need it and get a battery charger so you don't need a new battery so frequently. And, and then the, the uh, critical thing, check your, your tire when the weather gets cold, your tire pressure just naturally drops. So it's a good time to check that. And check your wiper blades to see if they've dried out and are, are, are falling off. And if you have an older car that you may be adding, adding uh, distilled water to quite a bit, adding to the radiator, check the mixture of your coolant to see okay, is it mostly water now? Do I need to replace the, the uh, coolant? So it's a 50-50 mix of coolant and distilled water. And, and then a weird one that is a, a, a problem on newer cars is the uh, blend doors that control uh, the airflow through your, your climate system inside your car. If you've left it all summer, you've left it on AC and venting out the dash door actuators, that are real simple, inexpensive motors that control movement of those doors. Um, a computer is, is monitoring the position of those, those little motors. And over the summer, or, or it's over the winter, if you're going into the summer, the uh, computer may have lost track of where that motor is. So you might need to drive around for a while. Uh, I've had to like take the, you get out of the dash, you take the motor off, put it back on, and then the computer says, okay, now I know where you are. And so, so a way to prevent that is to um, don't leave your, uh, either put your, if it's an automatic climate control system, put it on auto so the computer is naturally flipping all the doors around. Or middle of summer, hey, let's turn on the heat for a while. <laughs> Exercise those blend doors. I actually activities. had that problem just today with a vehicle that's been sitting for a, a lot. Hey, I wonder, Brian and Greg, do you have anything uh, for Tom before we get down to the vehicle business of the day? No, I appreciate that info. I, I, that was a new one on me. Uh, motors uh, forgetting, uh, computers yeah. forgetting where all the motors are. Uh, I don't feel so bad now that I'm forgetting. All the things <laughs> that. Yeah, it, well, it does make me feel better that I'm a big proponent of keeping my wife's um, uh, car in auto. I mean, I'm a, I just love hitting auto and just setting the temperature and letting it do its thing. So that's good to know. 
Well, Tom, we, we want you to, to stay on for the whole uh, podcast, not just for your portion. And we welcome you to jump in with any comments, whether they're relevant or not, because we don't necessarily <laughs> stick to a script here. But we have got a, a, a vehicle we were going to talk about, and I actually might throw in a, a, another one. But let's start with um, uh, the Mercedes CLA, particularly the CLA 35. Just this week, Mercedes, uh, one of the big weeks there, said, Basically, you like our small cars. We hope you love them. We're basically not so many people are buying SUVs. Uh, but the CL35 was, was, is a, it's a, it's a Mercedes AMG right off the bat. So it's the higher end of their small cars, and that's where they're going to be uh, concentrating their effort. But Greg and Brian, what was your impression of the uh, Mercedes CLA, AMG CLA35? And think Mercedes has got a point that they maybe should be paying more attention to cars like that instead of the entry level models. What do you think? Yeah, I, nice, very direct com, uh, point. Um, yeah, so I, I've driven now two AMG 35s, and I've been a fan of both of them the CLS uh, 35 and the, now the CLA. I mean, they are like right there in the middle. I mean, so it goes base CLA 250. AMG CLA 35, and then you have the big boys CLA 45. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised with the 35. Um, it's sporty when you want it to be, but it doesn't really beat you to death like the uh, CLA 45 has a tendency to do because that's like the extreme performance version. And I mean, it's, it, it, it always acts like that on the street. And I didn't really find that to be the case in the 35. I thought it was a really good mix of both comfort and sportiness. Yeah, you know, 300 horsepower in a car this size is like perfect, and it just goes with the overall uh, feel. Of the car, like when you're sitting in it, like everything just feels right. It feels like a hot hatch, almost like a DTI throwback or something. I mean, it is just rare. Steering wheel has a great feel to it, and uh, yeah, it's just it's just fun to drive. You know that that uh, to, uh, something else that happened this week that wasn't originally on our list, but we talked about it just before we uh, started recording. Uh, Volkswagen has unveiled a new, another, a, their second uh, a compact uh, SUV, the Taos. And this fits under uh, what they're already offering. So it's the smallest SUV they've offered so far. What do you think about that, guys? A lot of people are saying this is the replacement for the Rabbit, uh, for the Golf. Uh, I'll believe that when I see it. But uh, there was certainly room for it because the Tiguan was so big for a compact. So. There's certainly room for it, and uh, a lot of the interior specs are, you know, the same as like CRV, yeah, and, uh, Rav4, and uh, it looks good. I, you know, I think it's, uh, I think it'll be another hit for them for sure. Uh, one more thing about the CLA35. Sure. Um, I think sounded awesome for a four-cylinder. I generally never say any four-cylinder sounds awesome, but somehow AMG makes them sound like V8s, and it's, uh, it's awesome. Greg, anything on the Taos? Well, I mean, even in their, their press release, they mentioned that they're jumping into the most uh, popular SUV segment. And, you know, I, uh, I'm a fan of Volkswagen SUVs. I love the Atlas. I love the Tiguan. I almost bought a Tiguan. Um, but Robinson's right. It's, the Tiguan was always just like a little bit too big, I mean, for, for that category. Uh, it's kind of like a weird in-betweener. So <laughs> this one seems to be – this one definitely seems to be the right size and, and people want it. So I have no reason to think that it won't be a success for them. You know, we always talk about when we talk about the golf, what a great packaging they do. And here you've got a smaller uh, vehicle, substantially nine inches less length, they're a little nine, little nine two or whatever, than the uh, Tiguan. Yet the volume on the inside is only about one and a half cubic feet less. So they've done a, an even better job a packaging and uh, apparently the rear seat legroom is, is pretty outstanding. Uh, so um, I think they'll do well. It's a nice looking vehicle, nothing terribly flashy. We didn't, wouldn't expect it to be, but it, it looks good. I think they've introduced five SUVs in the last four years here in the U S yeah, something. They've like been that, busy. So. Okay. Let's move on to our lightning round. And we've, uh, We've got a, a, an interesting one, and this is uh, another continuation of something we talked about on our last podcast. 
On the last podcast, we discussed California's proposed ban on new internal combustion car sales, uh, combustion engine car sales by 2035. But let's discuss the possible effects on the classic car culture, which is a huge deal in California and elsewhere. Should owners be concerned that the ban will eventually extend to their classic cars? And in the event that they are banned from the roads, and this is a real stretch, what will the future look like for classic automobiles? Are we going to see a lot of conversions to EV like Jaguar did for that XKE? So let's take that ban in California and let's say that that's whatever the, the states like our home state of Maryland that can follow California's rules, suppose they implant that uh, ban here. What's going to happen to classic cars? Uh, I'm not really a futurist. I have enough problems dealing with uh, reality, but uh, I'm pretty sure there's been movies in the very topic, and it's uh, very apocalyptic, and uh, eventually a lot of cool cars come out of it, and they win in the end. <laughs> so I'm not really worried about the cars. The big thing is in California, what we consider classic cars and are still a lot of people's yeah. daily drivers. Just with the climate out there, you know, they've got 30-year-old cars that they're still driving since they bought new, not because they're classic car fans, but just because their car lasts forever. So uh, I, don't think, I don't think this is something we'll have to worry about in the near future anyway. I agree with Brian. The uh... – I think the classic car drivers are safe. The, the California has never gone after the classic car that's in the garage and gets driven, you know, 300 miles a year because it doesn't help them politically and it doesn't really have any impact on, on the environment. Um, the, the, the people that can afford new electric cars are fine. And the people with classic cars that have a garage to put a classic car in its baby are fine. It's, it's that middle group that's not 90% infinitely buys and or maybe only buys used cars because it, it has a huge impact on the used car availability. Uh, it used to be used cars were you had time and you had mileage that would determine the value of a used car. And in California, it'd be easy to find a you know 20, 15 year old, 20 year old car with low miles on it that you could buy for seven thousand dollars or five thousand dollars and drive it for 10 years happily. But if you have an electric car, whether it has 150,000 miles on it or 10,000 miles on it, once it's 12 years old, the battery's going to need to be replaced. So that's a built-in huge expense that, that, that really skews the, the used car market. If the used car market is only going to be electric cars. Yeah, I, th I personally think that initially, anyway, if they go through this ban, it, it's going to make uh, any used internal combustion engine car a lot more valuable. Yep. Yeah, car hoarders, you were right all along. That's yeah. what I tell my spouse. It's like, mm -hmm. those are all investments in the yard and in the garages. And <laughs> Greg, any comment on that? I mean, you're, you know, as the youngest in our group, you know, you're, what's your viewpoint on it? Uh, are you I, worried about, say, your offsprings growing up in a world that doesn't have any internal combustion engine vehicles? I wouldn't say I worry about it. I think that eventually, you know, I don't know how distant the future is for this, but eventually we will get away from it. Uh, but I do want to speak to the whole, you know, let's just say it happened. Let's just say they banned right. in some dystopian world, all internal combustion cars. Uh, like, so say you, you have a classic car, there, there would be a small group of people who would make the, you know, pay the large expense to convert it to an electric car. But then you kind of lose the whole aura of a classic car. I mean, the, the reason people like Not classic it, anymore, right? Because of the smell, because of how it drives, because of how it sounds. And then that's all gone. I mean, it's, don't get me wrong. It's cool when you see like a, like what Jag did, like you said, with the XKE converted to an all electric. Uh, but you know, it, it kind of takes away some of the, uh, you know, personality of what a classic car is. Yeah. So I just don't see that being a real trend if it ever were to happen. I think something you, you've, um, you talked about, we talk about California and we talk about Maryland, something they have in common is not the extreme cold winters. Uh, I haven't heard a lot of pushing for electric cars in Northern Minnesota or, or Canada. Because <laughs> 40 below trying to heat a car yeah. with a battery is, is difficult. And if you're trying to power the car with a battery too, it's, so yeah, I'm not sure, maybe the electric cars with propane heaters or something to warm up the battery and warm up the interior. I don't know, but. You know, 50, I, don't, I personally don't think it's going to happen by 2035, maybe 2050. I don't know. 
but 2035 is only 15 years away and that's just two product cycles. And right now, what are electric car sales? If you include all of them, they're way under 10% and probably will be for a while. So I think this is a political move. Of course, California has done this before by trying to mandate electric cars. And you had auto manufacturers going out and buying uh, golf cart companies so they would have something electric to sell. So we'll see. Stay tuned. Uh, hey, Tom, I, classic cars. What's in your garage? Do you have anything really um, special? Because I know you're a classic car buff. Well, well, classic is people tend to like what they they coveted they're familiar with from their childhood or they always yeah. wanted and i have an 86 mustang gt because that's what i drooled over when i was good in high for school. you and, and i have a 71 ford um ltd convertible with the blue vinyl oh. interior that my my parents 71 ford state wagon uh -huh. had so so my kids could experience that get roosted alive on the old old vinyl when the sun hits it so and, and then i just our daily drivers are old cars. Like I have a 92 Dodge van that I'm surprised every year that, or a lot of years that gets the most miles because it's like, well, we're taking the dog, let's put it in the, in the old van <laughs> or so. Yeah, it's me in a 64 Ford Galaxy 500 without the, uh, the, uh, the four door hardtop. Uh, that was uh, uh, kind of the car that I got my license in and I still, I still love it when I see one. Red vinyl interior again too. Well, it's cool being in the auto parts business that we have customers that any car you can think of, there's somebody that treasures that car. It means a lot to them. And th that's why I learned early on, never make fun mm -hmm. of any car <laughs> unless you own it yourself. My family owns a 93 Ford Tempo, so I can make fun of Tempo at any time. <laughs> Be careful. Be careful what you say. <laughs> right okay Dale, and it's a good one because i'm not sure there's an answer to this dale says we have a 2020 toyota highlander and we were told by a friend that if we leave the key fob in the vehicle for a long period of time it could drain the main 12 volt battery and within a week it will could be dead we've searched the internet got conflicting answers can you clear this up all right who wants to try and demiss this one I'm happy to go first. I, go first, Tommy. I, I think it's like the, remember the Lord of the Rings movie and books? The, Be my guest. The, yeah, Gollum and yeah. his ring and his precious. Well, uh, the car and, and it's Bob are like Gollum and it's precious. The, the car is always saying, where are you precious? And the, the, the Bob says, here I am. And, and and sometimes they're always talking, if they're in proximity and always talking to each other, it can drain both the car battery and the Bob or one or the other. But it may happen every time. So uh, I personally, my uh, dresser in my bedroom is over a car with a fob. So I, I wrap the fob with aluminum foil in my dresser. So it, <laughs> otherwise the battery goes dead even if I don't use it for, for anything. So, and it works. It, I think to, to be fair to, the, uh, to Dale, there is really not any concrete data on the internet at least as far as i looked i didn't see any like real articles written about it you have people who think they know what they're talking about on both sides people who say it absolutely will not kill the battery and people who say it absolutely will but what tom says is right i mean with these key fobs they're trying to find each other so even if it's just a small amount of juice being used it's trying to to stay in contact but i think the bigger point is you probably shouldn't leave your fob in the car or around it because if it's in the car, the car won't lock. So you have security issues there. Uh, and then obviously being around the car, if it's just in that range, I, I think like what Tom said is it's gonna use some sort of energy. Yeah, I can't possibly compete with Tom's answer. Um, I would like to get a Dan actually rather so good. But um, my, my only comment would be uh, if we get this guy's address because i'm kind of in the market for highlander actually <laughs> great. but it's new not anymore uh, you it's know got the, a, the, it's got a half dead battery <laughs> the key fob let's get it away from the car here john what i just said that it, you know just from if you do have the the best thing is to get the key fob away from the car because it has a relatively low power uh, to it. So 
it's got a limited range unless you want to stick it up next to your head or something. You've seen those on, on TV. Well, it, well like right. you said, it really is like a limited range because you could be mm -hmm. an arm's length away and try to touch it and it will not unlock. I mean, you pretty much have to have it like right up on the car, right. which is, is the point of it. Well, yeah, I think it varies a lot from car to car too. So it, yeah, a good rule is just keep the two separate because you can rent a car and you'd be surprised that okay wait this car is different than right. my the car i have at home and i think we're starting to have some connectivity problems today so we apologize for that but let's let's wrap this up with a um, a rant or rave anything bothering anybody this week uh, this is a time tom where we say that we love something we see out there in the on the roads or we really hate it and usually it's the latter uh, i've really liked over the last few weeks the the ford bronco hype it's like when the world is ending, we need a, a cool car that you can look forward to. <laughs> and, and then and then the guys, at, the folks at Jeep came out with a, a tempting 6.4 liter Wrangler. Yeah. <laughs> so so that, that, that's great. I, I really appreciate that. Built my morale and something to look forward to. Even, even if it's, they keep teasing us with the Bronco, oh, it's going to be six months, six months. It's, it's hey, something to look forward to. Who says horsepower is dead? I, I've got a rant, and I think this is one I've said before, but I've I noticed it a lot these days. You're going down the interstate. There's an exit coming up. Somebody's behind you, and they power past you and then go in front of you to get off at the exit. You know, it's like, what is that? What, what is that mentality? I mean, okay, there's, I guess they're showing who's boss, but is there – I don't – get it i just don't get it any enlighten me anybody come on brian robinson you're a good one for uh, me i would say they're not trying to make any type of power move they're just not paying attention where their exit is until the gps tells them oh this is your exit and then they're like oh i gotta get it over so they get over they're just doing what the car tells them to do they're really paying attention to the road i know it's just, you know i i must admit sometimes you just want to get off and chase them down and just never mind not a good, not a good idea. Fight the urge, John. Don't do it. <laughs> no, 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 not a good idea. All right, everybody. Thanks very much for uh, just having a great podcast. And Tom, I tell you, you made it with us today. It was it was terrific having you on with us. Hope you'll come back and do it again. No, yeah, well, thanks for inviting me. I enjoyed it. Very good. All right, everybody. That's the end of our podcast. Uh, Two hundred and forty. Thanks to Brian Robinson, to Greg Carlos, and of course to Tom Taylor. And uh, thanks to all of you for basically being fans of Motor Week, for watching us on your local public television station, also over on the Motor Trend Cable Network. And if you're not sure what time we're on, go to our web website, motorweek.org, pull down about the show, and you can put in your zip code and get a good idea of times in your local market. Uh, basically, if you've got a screen, you've got Motor Week. We uh, direct everybody to catch up on us. If you can't do it on the air, on cable, on our YouTube uh, channel, youtube.com slash motorweek, where we put all the latest road tests and features up pretty quickly after they've been seen on broadcast. And we just thank everybody for being a part of this uh, terrific show for our 40 years we're celebrating this year. So for all of us at Motor Week, we hope to see you soon. And as we always like to say, thanks for being a part of Motor Week. You've been listening to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by rockauto.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at motorweek.org. And watch MotorWeek, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.